refreshed because so many participants flooded it. So it's just the uh, mesmerizing memories of our uh, chief guest of the today. So we are starting. So hello everyone, a very good evening to all of you. I'm Shiva Pamar, president of Nishta, the civil service society of Hansraj College. Nishta Society founded in 2017 is a unique and innovative initiative of the college. It aims at creating uh, uh, an ecosystem of passionate civil services aspirants to converge and provide an upper hand over other aspirants. Our passionate members, convener, council students have made society a major asset for all the aspirants. And what considered by the society analysts as the most esteemed society of Delhi University, giving wings to our fundamental objective and intent are the interactive sessions, insightful conferences and astute discussions. And now finally, we have another major and awaited event on our head, which we called Class of Hansraj, a four day event with four exceptionally good personalities of the nation. As in recent trend, it is clearly evident that the portion of international relation has risen in civil services exams. So keeping this thing in mind, today we have Ambassador Sanjay Bhattacharya sir, graduated from St. Stephen's College and did his master's from Delhi School of Economics, presently a secretary in Ministry of External Affairs and has served India's ambassador to Turkey and Egypt and India's representative to the Arab League. He will be addressing us on the topic that is trends and challenges in India's foreign policy. I don't think that someone can explain this topic better than a person who himself experienced it and worked on it. As Sun Tzu rightly said, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting it. And I'm sure today all the people are going to learn so many things related to India's foreign policy and India's diplomacy. I, uh, it's an absolute pleasure that Sanjay Bhattacharya sir has spared time from his busy schedule to enlighten us on the topic trends and challenges in India's foreign policy. In the last, we will take some questions from the comment section and they should be relevant. So thank you, sir, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, firstly, uh, congratulations to uh, the um, Civil Services Society Nishta of Hansraj College for organizing this. Um, I myself, as you mentioned, have been a student of Delhi University and I've been around your college and I have very many fond memories of uh, visiting your college uh, and the hostels uh, where we had many friends. Um, today, as you mentioned, I will talk about foreign policy trends and challenges. Uh, since we are short of time, I shall make my comments somewhat brief. Some of it will be personal about my own experiences, and then we will look forward to taking a few questions as well. Uh, I will have to conclude by 5.15 because I do have to go for another meeting after this, so we'll try and arrange it within that time. Uh, firstly, what is diplomacy all about? It's about representing your country. Uh, I see this as a job of a negotiator. Uh, what we try and do is find acceptable options uh, which will expand the opportunities uh, where you can further your interests. In broad terms, diplomacy is uh, we seek to strengthen relations between states. Uh, we try to promote business interests and we facilitate uh, cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. And that's how we engage with the other side. Foreign policy, as you can understand, is really something that emerges from the way your domestic structure is. So your own nation is the, uh, the basis of your foreign policy. Uh, you would remember that uh, more than 2000 years ago, uh, Chanakya had laid down in his Arthashastra some of the basic tenets of, uh, of diplomacy. And this is something that is still very relevant. Uh, he, of course, looked at it in terms of you know, uh, the enemy's friend is your uh, friend. Uh, the enemy's enemy is your friend. Uh, you needed to have very reliable information. There was a honeycomb of structures and it was actually built in those times. And a lot of it was based on the old concept of zero sum game. So I would have to go to war uh, to inflict damage upon the other in order to have certain assurances for my own state. It was built on power structures. Today, uh, that has been evolved into something that we call about national strength and national interests. 
so today we our most of our foreign policy is based on interactive models in other words we look at concepts like reciprocity uh, we look at concepts like mutual interest and mutual benefit and this has given rise to what is now termed as win-win solutions so apart from the zero sum games uh, you know even till the last century and even today there are certain countries that practice that but if you need sustainable relations you will have to have win-win solutions you know you would have also come across concepts like soft power and hard power joseph nye uh, who had brought these about and also smart power as to how you can achieve your objectives so what we as diplomats try to do is to provide choices to generate choices so that you can have leverage when you deal with the other country so that you can have a certain countervailing force uh, and all in the uh, object of pursuit of your national interest now i will move to the that second part the main part of my uh, presentation today for all of you and i will identify five broad themes uh, which are the major trends and i will narrate to you some of the experiences that i have had as a diplomat over the last 35 years the first major trend that i want to talk about is neighborhood first you all understand what this means that your neighborhood is very important uh, you know uh, in uh, 2010 i was in bangladesh which is our neighbor to the east and we were negotiating something called the land boundary agreement Uh, you would recall that when bangladesh was created we had at that time with sheikh mujib worked out a certain land boundary agreement but there were certain pockets which were left unattended in fact there were what were called adverse possessions or settlements which were inside india which belonged to bangladesh or settlements inside bangladesh which belonged to india so around 2010 we started the process where a small team which included the current foreign secretary harshvardhan shringla and myself on the indian side with survey and many other uh, officials and colleagues from the bangladesh side we actually went walked across the border and we identified these pockets and found out a solution so in 2011 when manmohan singh visited bangladesh we signed the land boundary agreement now what was this based on you know i talked earlier that uh, there are these win win solutions that you must have your neighborhood first policy is something that cannot be guided by a zero sum game you know it just doesn't work in your neighborhood because it will lead to friction and dissatisfaction and that is something that you would definitely wish to avoid uh, particularly in your neighborhood so what we do is we try and have a dynamic solution which is interactive which engages both sides looks at the interest and sometimes you have to have a more generous approach because what you at the end of the day wish to have is that you wish that your neighbors become partners in your development agenda because as i said foreign policy is something that evolves from your internal strength and your own development agenda is something that will be critical in this and if you have your neighbors who are part of that you will actually benefit a lot and so sometimes reciprocity might even have to be sacrificed so you might wish to give more in favor of gaining more leverage in the neighborhood the second major trend i want to speak to you about is called the indo pacific i don't know if you've come across this but this has become a very major trend which will continue to be with us for the next several decades and i go back to my post in when i was posted in japan and this was in 2007 when um president obama of the us visited tokyo and he spoke to spoke about something called pivot to asia this was when the us policy was shifting from the atlantic focus to the pacific focus and this was something that led to a new understanding of how relations within the asian uh, continent and its relations with the rest of the world would be uh, would be gathered and how they would develop you know in the past we had something Uh, which was for our asean which was called uh, the lukeist uh, and then i was here in headquarters uh, you know in the uh, period between 2012 and 2015 and at that time we evolved from the lukeist policy of india to what then became known as the act east policy 
And in some ways, I want to tell you this, that that particular policy has extended into what is now known as the Indo-Pacific. You're familiar that, you know, in the uh, centuries past, uh, we've had very historical ties with Southeast Asia and with East Asia. Uh, I have seen uh, Hindu temples in China, uh, temples of Shiva in, in Chuanzhou, for instance. And of course, you're all familiar with the huge uh, Indian and Buddhist presence uh, that was there across Southeast Asia, you know, in Indonesia. Uh, and this was, uh, even today, if you look at the very peaceful nature of uh, the people in Southeast Asia, uh, there is this genesis which has come about from the Buddhist and Hindu origins of our exchanges. Um, but what Look East had done when this had been evolved in, uh, in the last century was to add an economic dimension to a very close cultural connection that existed between the people. And Actis was to take this, these interlinkages even further to build a certain political security uh, dimension to our relations. And these were largely Indian initiatives. We were working very closely with the countries of Southeast Asia and East Asia to try and develop this. So what we then find today, which is a rising trend, which is the Indo-Pacific, it largely came out of actually Western thinking. Uh, as I said, Obama's pivot to Asia, then there was Japan, uh, and Prime Minister Abe had talked about the confluence of the seas of linking the Indian Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, people see, is this like a counterweight to China? And perhaps, you know, it's, it's a confluence of democracies. Uh, in our opinion, the Indo-Pacific is an open and inclusive uh, rule-based system. Uh, and it is essentially something that provides the basis for exchanges, both economic as well as political security. And we've had our own understanding. Uh, I wonder if you remember that when Prime Minister uh, went to Singapore in 2018, he had outlined the concept of Sagar, which is security and growth for all in the region. And this is how Asia would be linked further towards, towards Africa as well. And it, um, uh, this is something, uh, the Indo-Pacific is something that has gained a lot of momentum in recent years. And you will find supporters of the Indo-Pacific idea, uh, not just amongst the countries of the region, but also in France, Germany, UK, uh, the European Union has come out with a paper on this. Uh, this has also led to a certain uh, grouping called the Quad, which is uh, a confluence of India, Japan, US, and Australia. And we've had many interactions on this. And so Indo-Pacific, you will find is something that will uh, gain in strength over a period of time. The third one is that today foreign policy is one in which your strategic security interests also have to deal with non-state actors. So normally diplomacy is that you deal with states, uh, with other foreign countries and the states are their governments. But today, the way things have happened, uh, you have to deal with non-state actors. And this became very evident in my last two assignments when I was ambassador uh, first in Cairo and then in Ankara. We saw the unrest in the Middle East. We saw how fundamentalism had grown and how terrorism became a tool for, uh, for this particular fundamentalism to expand. Uh, terrorism, of course, is uh, a menace. And, but the fact is that terrorism exists and we as states have to deal with it. Uh, terrorism in our neighborhood has been there for a long time, and we know how Pakistan has been involved in it for a very long period of time. But if you look around the world, there are many manifestations of terrorism. These are done by non-state actors, but very often they have the tacit understanding and even support of states. And so it is very important, both at a political and official level, to have greater coordination and cooperation. And so a lot of our efforts today uh, in terms of our security structures is to have discussions with other states about particularly about terrorism, about non-state actors. And terrorism manifests itself in many ways. There are cross-border crimes which happen, which could be of financial crimes, which could be of narcotics, which could be of the illicit smuggling or trafficking of human beings. And it manifests itself in many ways. And terrorism, which is the, the most violent form, of course, is one which is something that we 
all seek to work together. And there are various mechanisms in which we do this. Uh, but the essence that I was trying to say is that today, uh, states also have to take into cognizance non-state actors in dealing and in advancing their foreign policy. The fourth broad trend that I want to bring to your attention is this dichotomy between globalism or globalization and protectionism, which, is, which are two dichotomies, but they're happening at the same time. I remember I was in Brussels at the turn of the century. I was dealing with the European Union affairs. And at that time, we had started a discussion on having FTA with EU, which is still under discussion. But the idea that trade and investment are so important became evident to us because we would recall that in the early 90s, we had started a process of reform and liberalization, which made our economy more integrated and more globalized. And in order to do that, we had to engage with our various partners today. This contradiction that I was wanting to tell you has become very apparent today, uh, particularly if you look at the COVID pandemic, uh, where many countries are going into a shell. But this has got a longer history. What has essentially happened in many ways is that democracy was one in which many minorities became disenfranchised. And so when they became disenfranchised, they then either became rebellious or they became uh, militant. The same thing was happening with the advance of capitalism as well. Capitalism, as you know, was a mercantilist approach and you had the advance of capitalism going across continents where you would build up supply chains, you would build up markets, you would have resource bases, you would set up production centers. But at the end of the day, you were promoting your capitalist interest. But the advance of capitalism ironically led to one uh, in which society saw greater inequities come up. And the inequities as they expanded, again, marginalized certain segments of people. So as I was saying, there is this interplay between the domestic and the, and the external. Um, what we saw that this marginalization uh, led to demands or calls for protectionism. So while on the one hand, both democracy and capitalism uh, call for greater globalization, because that is the way you can more efficiently work out your resources, uh, the marginalization of certain uh, segments of the population uh, have led to calls for protectionism. And today, in a sense, if you look at the new idea that we have, which is of Atmanirbhar Bharat, in a sense, which is an advocation of domestic policy extending externally, Atmanirbhar Bharat is not an inward looking policy. It's not something that, of an autarchic world. So we are actually going to be much more closely integrated with the global system, while at the same time, making our country much more competitive and efficient internally, so that we can become more efficiently integrated with the rest of the global system. Uh, the last, uh, the fifth trend that I wanted to talk to you about was about uh, new and emerging technologies and the manner in which they will guide not just domestic policy, but also foreign policy. This is your ICT revolution, your fourth industrial revolution, the way data is managed and how artificial intelligence and, and um, you know, these things will become more and more a part of your life. Uh, I, again, I go back to the time when I was in, in Japan. Uh, you would not be surprised that we had as many as 500 uh, Indian scientists who were working on various joint projects or who were with various laboratories over there. This is a trend that we see also in Germany, Israel, and of course, you are quite familiar uh, that we have a very large talent pool that is there in the United States and different parts of, of Europe as well. So why is this happening? Because today we are in an era of disruptive transformation and the role of technology is vital. So we see today that the life of new technologies is getting shorter, but their outreach to the people, to the population is wider. It's becoming wider and wider. And innovation in this particular scenario plays an extremely important role because you constantly have to adapt technology the modes of delivery. So when you see startups uh, becoming unicorns, uh, you know, incubation centers are being promoted. It's because you have to find better ways to connect with the target audience and so that you can optimize the market opportunities. And in this 
uh, data and the digital world will be the more preferred ways in which uh, the, the new world will communicate with one another. And I believe that in this, we have a huge advantage because we have the advantage of the demographic dividend. Like you, we are a, a country with a very large population of youth. And youth are the ones who are leading this particular movement of this uh, disruptive transformation with technology as the core, in which education skills are really very much more important than most other things. And therefore, uh, we do need to kind of continue and proceed with this. Uh, today, for instance, my engagement with a country that I deal with, Israel, uh, a large part of that is really focused on how you can promote incubators, how you can link up incubation centers, how you can actually have hackathons, how, like we did one uh, the other day with the ASEAN, how you can promote innovation, how you can uh, encourage venture capitalists to get involved. And in many ways, this is what diplomacy is doing today. So to conclude, let me say that, you know, as I had said earlier, soft power is very important. But at the end of the day, if you want to have an abiding effect, you will need hard power. National strength is vital because unless your country is strong, you cannot really have a very cogent uh, diplomatic approach. Uh, and as I was saying just now, we are in a very, very dynamic and transformational era. So we have to be very agile. There is call for reform, including in the multilateral systems. And these are things that we have to focus on so that there is greater uh, interaction between all these agencies. And in this, I believe India is in a sweet spot because we are viewed as a nation of values and principles and, and, and also as a trusted friend by all countries across the world. However, we need to build upon our capacity to deliver. And this is also on issues or on projects. Uh, but I believe that as India grows, and today we are, as I said, uh, a country that is growing much faster than many others, uh, we will have uh, this particular ability expanded even further. And during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, which we're all going through, uh, you would have noticed that India became the first provider or a first responder, uh, including of COVID, of Corona vaccines, for instance, to different parts of the world. And that is something that has greater currency. I understand many of you are probably also preparing for the UPSC civil service examinations. And you must, um, since I've been through that process myself, I thought I would just share with you that, you know, you should look at yourselves, if you are in that particular vocation, to look at yourself as officers of the constitution, because at the end of the day, what we all do as, uh, as officials in the government is to work for the constitution of the country. And it's a marvelous constitution. So um, this is one, I think, as I said, India is in a sweet spot. So it's also an era of entrepreneurship. And um, so there are many, many opportunities. Uh, but if I were to kind of be at the juncture like you are looking for a career ahead, if I had to make a choice, I've had such a great time as a diplomat, I would uh, probably make that same choice once again. Uh, so I wish you all the best. Um, and I will leave some time so that we can have at least a couple of questions. Thank you. You indeed explained every topic and aspect in a very prolific manner. We received many questions, but uh, due to the constant of time, we will be able to take only a few questions. Uh, sir, first question is related to a country where you served as an ambassador of our country, that is Turkey. As we have seen uh, our relation deteriorating at another level with Turkey. Uh, recently, uh, Prime Minister Modi cancelled his visit to Turkey and uh, President Erdogan in Pakistan's assembly said that uh, we will win on Kashmir issue as same as that Mustafa Kamal Pasha won the Gallipoli campaign. So, sir, what is the, uh, like, how can we improve our relation and what is the re reason that it has deteriorated that much? Maybe what you could do is you could also put a second question and I'll deal with both together. Okay, okay. Uh, sir, next question is related to a Middle East country, that is Iran, that Iran has become a very major critic of India and drawn international criticism at various international levels. And uh, so, sir, do really Iran have that much power that they can isolate us in Middle East or in the Islamic bloc they have created? Okay, 
So let me take these two very quickly. Uh, firstly, about Turkey. Uh, you know, we have very historic relations with Turkey. And, and you must realize that Turkey is really an amazing country, which has had uh, remarkable economic growth in the last three decades. Uh, I remember when I was leaving Cairo for Turkey, I had noticed that 30 years ago, uh, Turkey and Egypt, as you know, have similar populations, uh, but, and they had similar GDP at that point of time three decades ago. But today, uh, the GDP of Turkey is three times the size that of Egypt. Of course, the last couple of years have been a little bad for the Turkish economy and they've slipped a bit. But essentially what they've done is they have done an excellent job of getting their economy in place and having great growth. They're also very closely plugged in with the European system. They're also a member of NATO. And we have very close relations on many fronts. It is true that there are differences in any relationship. And we have certain differences with Turkey as well. But I believe that when one works on the commonalities that we have, when one works on the mutual interests that we have, one can overcome many of these differences. Uh, so far as uh, Jammu and Kashmir is concerned, and I was there when uh, you know, 370 and others had been enacted, uh, I had found a great degree of receptivity amongst the people of Turkey. So you must realize that the people of Turkey have always uh, been great friends of India and they continue to be great friends of India. So if there are certain differences that are there because of certain personalities, one should not feel dissuaded about it, but should continue the, the path. About Iran, you know, um, I, I, I'm a little surprised because uh, Iran is actually a very old traditional friend of India. Uh, and India and Iran have very, very close relations over centuries. And our relations extend into various different aspects of our life. So I would not say, <laughs> I would not put Iran in that category as you were describing. But uh, Iran has also been through various uh, 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 episodes in, in, in its recent history. Uh, but the uniqueness of India, and that is what I was saying, that India is seen as a trusted friend by most. And that is the case with Iran as well. So Iran sees India as a friend. We see Iran as a friend as well. So, I mean, between Turkey and Iran, I would say both of these countries are those that we would wish uh, to have great friendship with, and there's huge opportunity. With Iran, I don't take your classification that you express, but uh, we, are, we actually have a very, very strong collaborative relationship with them. We can take another two questions quickly. Uh, Shiva, you are on mute actually. I'm sorry. Uh, so, sir, uh, one question is that something which we are discussing from independence, and that is what is uh, what what is the like? Do you really think that India can get the uh, seat permanent seat in United Nations Security Council in nearby future? Uh, what is the next question? Because I'll take two together, and these may be okay. the last two. Okay, so, sir, last question will be that uh, what are the challenges that India's current foreign policy have and what all necessary steps and reforms are needed in this? Okay, well, on challenges and reforms, you know, I think um, I basically outlined five broad trends and challenges. And I think, you know, each trend is also a challenge. It's an interactive process. So, uh, diplomacy is not like a one-stop game. It has to constantly uh, evolve and respond to the situation as you see around. So everything is a challenge. Everything is also an opportunity. And that's the way we deal with it as professionals. Uh, you also asked about the UN Security Council. Let me say, you know, when the UN Security, when the UN was formed, India was uh, an original member, as you know. And this was even before India had, um, uh, had got the British out. Uh, of the country. Um, but the manner in which the UN and many of the other international organizations were, were structured were really like a, a relic of that particular time of the post-war uh, period. And they reflected the priorities of the post-Second World War period. And it also reflected the alliance systems that were there at that time. And it kept out people who were uh, either uh, seen as 
the, the other side as the enemy, like Japan or Germany, or seen as the underdog, which were the colonial uh, uh, remains. And so for a very long period of time, uh, many of these countries, which belong to the others, uh, did not get adequate voice. But that's what I was saying, that in this transformational era, there is now greater democracy in the world, uh, and this process of democratization now has to go beyond just the countries themselves into the multilateral and international institutions. And so the UN, of course, is, is at the center point. The UN has been incapable of reforming itself in the manner that it should have. That is not to say that the UN has not done great work. They have done great work in many areas in terms of security, in terms of, uh, of development, uh, and in terms of driving the agenda towards the millennium goals, the SDGs. So they have done a lot of good work, but I think on the basic structure of how they would respond to the new challenges and the emerging challenges, the UN has been inadequate. On the important aspect of the UN Security Council, which in many ways dominates the UN, although there is a general assembly, which is the more uh, democratic setup where everyone, every country has the same vote, which is the way democracies uh, run, uh, unlike the UN Security Council where there's a veto. The UN Security Council, because it is a club of people who have the power, has been more reluctant to actually change. Uh, and there have been many attempts uh, uh, across the years to try and bring about the reform. And they did tinker with it, but essentially the structure of the UN Security Council has remained uh, the way it was. The most recent uh, developments, as you would know, are what is known as the Intergovernmental Negotiation Process, or the IGN process. Now, this is something in which uh, we have not seen great headway, I must admit, but the attempt, as you know, today we are a non-permanent member of the Security Council uh, for the years 21 and 22, uh, for these two years, and together with uh, like-minded countries, which have similar aspirations, uh, what we are trying to do is to bring about uh, a text-based negotiation so that, you know, uh, the General Assembly has its due role and that the UN Security Council uh, will then see its reforms. Um, but at the end of the day, I must also tell my young friends that uh, while uh, the UN Security Council does remain the principal international organization that takes care of uh, security interests in particular, and UN also has this additional development mandate that it looks after, uh, if a country grows, and today the weight of India in global affairs is much, much greater than it ever was before, and if a country grows, then you will find that its voice, its weight, its leverage in all international affairs will also continue to grow, irrespective of what the UN Security Council composition is, irrespective of what its vote in the World Bank or IMF is. And so to pursue um, uh, at the same time. I mentioned to you about uh, the, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific, which is a new emerging understanding so it's not a bloc, it's not a NATO, uh, but it's a new understanding of democracy. And there are many others. Over the years, we've seen many others. So India has always been a strong voice. And today, I think we are at that, again, I use the same word, sweet spot, to become an even stronger voice. And I think the role, uh, you all are in a very exciting phase because you are part of this growing India, this aspirational India. And I think the manner in which you will be able to bring about this change will perhaps be far more telling than the previous generations have been. So I wish you all the best and uh, have a great day. Uh, so sir, with the final question, we have come to an end of a short, but a very, uh, very informative session. The way you explained everything made it winning encomiums among the participants and our members. So with this note, I inform the closure of the first chapter of Class of Hansraj. And lastly, I want to pay thanks to you, sir, for joining us, for sparing time from your busy schedule and gracing the occasion with your kind presence. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the best to all of you. Yeah. OK. Fine. Let's go. Um, did they get the MRW data? Uh, I'll just check, sir.
Uh, hi guys, uh, you can fill the feedback form provided in the chat box as well as you can follow us on, on our social media handles. Also guys, regarding those who were need, not able to join the session, we would be like releasing the recorded video of this session today itself on a YouTube channel. So you can go and subscribe to the channel and uh, like those who were not able to join can like go through the session at the glance. If you have any further queries, you can write in the chat box and we would try to answer them.